Here we go. Welcome to our second episode of Checking In with OCG. So in this series, I host OCG staff members to chat about the latest and greatest happenings going on within the world of sponsored project administration. Here with us today is Director of Contracts, Gary Henry. So for the first 20 minutes, I'll be asking Gary some questions I prepared. And then for the last 10 minutes, I'll open it up to questions from y'all, the audience. So if questions come up during the interview, hold on to them. And we've carved out time just for you at the end. All right, so let's get started. Gary, appreciate you setting some time aside to chat with me. Uh, we're gonna begin by just establishing a basic understanding of the contracts team. So as it turns out, your team covers multitudes of needs within sponsored project administration. Could you explain the general contracts team and how that breaks down into more specific teams within OCG? Yeah, you bet. Um, well, first, I want to begin with um, saying thanks to you, Nikki, for setting these up. I think um, we need to recognize you've done such a great job over the past six months um, while we've been in this remote um, situation, helping to keep us connected, helping to allow us to communicate um, and interact as much as we possibly can with each other and um, more importantly with our campus community. So first of all, thanks for doing that. I, I think that these sessions are um, something that I think are really important given that environment. Um, and I guess also I want to make sure I thank everybody that's attended today. You guys, everybody's busy. Everybody's crazy busy. Um, so I appreciate knowing that uh, you were able to maybe carve some time out and I hope I'm able to, to deliver any uh, questions you may have and, uh, and kind of work through some some um, insights into what we do day to day. Um, okay, so the question, what is the contracts team about? Well, I think first and foremost, just from an organizational structure perspective, um, calling us the contracts team is probably a, a misnomer. Um, we are actually a combination of a lot of different functions. Um, to begin with, we have contracting officers that support um, all the contracting awards and awards that are uh, supported by the contracts team at the initial stage and, and all the modifications come into play. Um, but we also have contract administrators that support um, the goes contracting officers and some of the administrative modifications, but also tremendous number of uh, agreements without funds um, and other um, documentation requirements as a holistic um, contracting part of the team. Uh, along with that, we have the subcontracts and subawards team uh, led by Megan Shosker. Um, as it sounds, subcontracts are born out of contracts and subawards are born out of grants. Um, so that's a, a growing area as well, but that's under the umbrella of the contracts team. In addition, service agreements and the service uh, agreements team. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more, I think, in a, a later question. Um, but it's a tremendous area that we picked up about three years ago um that frankly was not being looked at as closely as they needed to do from a compliance standpoint so we're learning a lot um that's led by jay butler is the contracting officer and, and rachel baldwin is the contract administrator supporting that but a growing growing area and finally um a program management office that's dotted line to us it was underneath our office um in full but it's supporting the national security initiative uh, to a good degree but the PMO led by Richard May is a, a growing entity to support those uh, specific awards that require either a level of complexity or actually have been called out um, in the um, proposal that they need a program manager to help manage that relationship between the PI and the sponsor in a way that we don't normally do. That's another area that's growing, all comes under the contracts team umbrella. Um, so again, it, it Kind of a misnomer, a lot of things going on, um, but uh, a great group of people supporting um, those actions. All right, so contracts, when we hear contracts team, we got contracts, we got subcontracts, we got program management, project management, uh, services. Am I missing anything? That's a lot. I, you know, probably. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of my team on here, so if I miss anything, I am certain that they will correct it with me as we go through all the questions. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It took me a little bit to, when I did arrive at uh, OCG, to figure out that contracts was not just contract officers and administrators. 
So thanks for clarifying that. Um, and now that we've established, there's a lot more of the contracts team than most of us know about. Could you maybe tell us more about the documents that the contracts team supports? So I know this list goes beyond funding agreements. Yeah, um, and also the disclaimer right off the bat is to say, we there's always gray, there's always gray areas. So everything I'm gonna tell you is what we believe it to be and what it generally should be, but we need to work through the gray as best we can. Um, we touch a lot of documents as they're associated with research agreements. Sometimes we get reached out to uh, for certain documents that have no tie to research, and we try to push those to the right uh, office as appropriate. Um, so everything I walk through is a, it's associated with those research type activities. So again, the basics as you might understand, uh, initial contract award documentations, modifications, uh, administrative uh, funding actions, no cost extensions, and those types of things, supplemental awards that change the scope of the award and increase the value. But we also touch grant type agreements at times if there are terms that are attached to that um, agreement that necessitate negotiation and interaction with the sponsor. Sometimes I think we get a wrapped around the axle on the title of the agreement, right? So just because it's called a contract, it may not walk, talk, you know, like a duck, like a contract. And same thing with the grant agreement could be other titles. So it's how the award behaves is what we um, make the determination of whether it goes to the grants team or the contracts team. So that's always something to think about. You may have a grant that you see is effectuated by the contracts team and, and the rationale behind that is the way it behaves. Um, underneath the uh, subcontracts and sub awards are exactly what I talked about briefly before. Um, those awards that we are, have outgoing funding to entities that we have uh, put as a part of a proposal, part of our budget to whether it uh, could be a, a small business, a startup, it could be uh, a foundation, it could be a variety of things, could be other universities, could be very large entities, um, depending upon how that scope is developed, what that PI is put together, but that's money going out. Um, and one of the things I always like to highlight with that is money coming in is, is very important and, and, and all of those things, obviously, but money going out is equally important. And there's the risk that goes along with that because the, the sponsor that we um, have received funding from expects us to manage the sub awards and the subcontracts. Um, that's where the privity, that's what the word is when we have that uh, relationship between those subcontracts and sub awards. So important. Um, and again, Megan Chosker is leading that with a great team um, supporting um, that uh, requirement. Um, service agreements. Um, if you haven't taken the service agreement training, um, I know we have one to you in not too distant future. Take that understanding because it's a growing area and it, it definitely um, interacts with the departments in a way that's different from some of the sponsored research agreements. Um, without getting too much detail and taking away their, their thunder when they present two types. You've got the um, service agreements, essentially are we're performing a service that is not research, meaning we're working through it, but we're not furthering the knowledge or furthering research. Um, you could have what's called rate-based, which essentially is, I consider it catalog-based, we have established pricing that the PIs work with uh, the budget and fiscal planning to set those pricing uh, structures up to then be able to offer those services to industry and other entities. Um, that is, again, more like running the test or providing some knowledge on a particular area that they can define. Um, there's also service agreements that are more scope-based. So they're more research-like, but you can't define what um, the, the amount of uh, interaction is going to be. So it's broader. Um, but again, it's not research. It's not furthering the knowledge, but you can't define the scope. Um, one of the examples I always like to throw out is one of those large service agreements that may be scope based is something that LASPA does in mission operations. That is actually flying, helping to fly satellites for other entities, but it is a service that you're providing, not a research uh, entities. And again, large dollar, pretty complex. Um, and it's a growing area as PIs recognize the need to maintain compliance under this area. Um, next thing that I'd like to touch on is the agreement without funds. Um, this is like a big bucket of stuff that primarily our contracting uh, administrators are, are leading, our CEOs do touch them, um, and grants does touch some uh, AWOFs as we call them, but that includes material transfers agreements, uh, data transfer and use agreements, non-disclosure agreements, uh, memorandums of understanding, uh, 
memorandums of agreement, creatives, all those things um, don't have any funds coming with them, but they are really important. And we are getting a, a lot of those coming through because they are a enabler for research. A great example is an NDA is of an industry partner wants to work with us in a non-disclosure agreement. They want to exchange some proprietary information to us to be able to decide whether they want to interact with the university. So in many cases, it's that first step to that research interaction. Um, oftentimes, we try to not have an NDA in place, try not to exchange proprietary information because as a university, we like to maintain our openness. But when that is needed, that's um, working through those. But again, a growing area that we're, we're uh, seeing more and more interaction. Um, all of those require a level of negotiation. That's the, the other thing I wanna make sure everybody takes away. It's not just pushing a piece of document uh, documentation through, it takes the back and forth, takes the negotiation. So even there's not funding, um, that interaction is still occurring. Thanks, Gary. If I missed anything, my folks will bring it up later. <laughs> Um, so you kind of alluded to this in your, your answer just now. It's been a big year for contracts. So can you speak to what you've been seeing out there and maybe offer an explanation about why there's been an increase in the university's sponsored project contract volume? And yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me begin with, it's been a big year for CU. Um, so, you know, we're the enablers, um, the grants team and the contracts team, the proposals, uh, as they push um, the proposals out. So we're seeing a lot of work by our PIs to, to work on increasing their level of awards and, and the, the interactions they have. So um, as a proportion, contracts has also increased in subcontracts and all the uh, documents that I had talked about earlier. You know, from the time I've been here, which is four years this month, actually, I think, three or four years, something like that. Um, we've gone from roughly 400-ish million to approaching 600 million. And that's a, a marked increase um, in our, our you know, dollars and awards. And you'd love to say, I think Terry even said it, and our Rio all staff, you know, it'd be great if we just got a couple of hundred million awards and we, you know, called it, but we don't. We get the 100,000 here, you know, 500,000 here. So they begin to um, grow and grow over time. Um, the, the challenge with it, um, and I just think some transaction, we just actually did a review of our workload from the previous year. And we had a roughly a 28% increase in transactions, you know, war transactions actually, you know, um, pushing the document through the system to get it to speed type setup and, and over to CCO, 28% um, increase just year over year. And that's, that's significant. Um, and I think that that's something that um, we're addressing and trying to work on, but I think it's also a testament to just the amount of work our PIs are doing. And, and the amount that the DRAs are also having to support and the you know, financial analysis um, that's going on at the department level. So we're all feeling it. You know, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that um, our, you know, what we're feeling is unique to us, we're all feeling it, but that's the reason. Um, I will tell you also that the level of complexity has increased. Um, some of that is related to the types of sponsors we're touching, um, some of the industry partners. We do a lot of education um, when we are interacting with our um, sponsors, if they have not done a lot of work with universities, or I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know, the university is, tends to be a unique entity, whether it's because of the state constitution interaction or just some of the terms and conditions that come through from an educational component. Um, but the complexity is increasing. Some of our sponsors, even uh, those we've worked with all the time, NASA, they are not, um, Things have changed on their side just as much on ours. Like we have some insight, not as much on others, but it's complexity. So the numbers only tell part of the story. So that 28% increase, the time is the other part that really is hard to measure. Um, but that is the other part that I think that I, um, we're seeing more and more. Um, and I talked a little bit about it. You know, um, having been federal government before, I can say this that people don't understand how universities work um, as much as they um, maybe should. And the federal government is going through what, I, they have a bathtub effect where they're bringing in a lot, lot more new people into the government um, side of the house that um, may don't, not necessarily have the level of experience that others have. So all of this is coming together um, to cause not only just uh, an increase in the numbers, but that complexity and, and the time it takes to get contracts through. 
Yeah, so as, as we grapple with this increase and, and hope to keep this influx going, there's been a lot of work towards streamlining our processes. So I know one project in particular is a collaboration with UC Denver. Um, could you tell us more about that? Um, sure. Um, and everything I say is um, um, at least tied to the AB Nexus website. So if you search for that, just AB Nexus, um, you'll, you'll um, learn a little bit more um, as to what I'm going to say, because I'm sure I'll miss something on this because it's an evolving program. So AB um, Nexus is is the project yeah project. it's called so I'll, I'll let me start from the beginning ah. so um everybody recognizes that we have uh four campuses one system and that's a great commercial that we have out there that you know what is it four campuses one cu or whatever that is not quite true um and but there's reasons behind it right and um and it goes back years and years and decades but what was recognized um through um leadership many levels above me um, was that man there's a we probably ought to be able to work a little bit more collaboratively with our sister campuses and the first one that they thought was um, right for um, review was that interaction with um, Anschutz. Um, the financial futures program I think um, most of you probably have heard about it at least had a series of different projects to try to find you know ways for efficiencies perhaps ways to grow funding and, and those types of things. Um, so Anschutz CU Boulder collaboration was, was one that was, was, that was teed up, looked at two primary aspects, um, one of which was the inter administrative interaction. How do we work with each other, you know, as we um, award subcontracts and, and documents back and forth to each other? And the other one was just how do we work together with, from a PI perspective? So there's two distinct areas. You've got the administrative side and then the, um, the research collaboration, I'll call it. Um, they um, wanted us to try to refine those ways to break down barriers that although we are two separate institutions uh, entity wise, even though we're under one institution CU system wise, how do we break that down as best we can? Um, we have two different cage codes and two different DUNS numbers. So from the federal government's lens, we are two different entities. And again, we looked at trying to bring all that together um, and you're under one DUNS and one cage. And again, I can't even get into the, 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 the challenges behind that, but it was decided at this point, let's get as close as we can to that point. Um, you know, close to a co-PI, uh, PI kind of relationship. So that's what we did. We, we sat uh, down for the uh, several months, uh, several on my team were part of that, Megan and Catherine Snyder from Proposals and Ron from, from Grants and others. Um, and then our counterparts at, at Anschutz. A lot of help by Nicole Jenkins, if she's on here, I gotta give her a shout out because she facilitated that uh, discussion and allowed us to really dig in and, and dive in. And, and the first thing I would always say is, gee, how come we even do this decades ago, right? I mean, this is, this is silly. Um, they had at certain points in time, but I think that from a variety of reasons, systems didn't talk to each other, the systems weren't mature enough. And, and frankly, that 45 minutes that we have between each other might as well be several states. Um, so we actually came together and I think did some great work in learning about each other. Their structure, structure is totally different than ours. Um, we have a, a large central office. They are more distributed. Um, and so just that kind of um, discussion had to be had. At the end of the day, what we were able to accomplish, and I would say still accomplishing, because we've got to definitely tie some uh, things up um, from a process standpoint, documentation, and all the things that you do when you put projects in is we were able to set up a master collaboration agreement, which essentially is a master set of terms to preclude having to negotiate with each other. It seems kind of silly, um, but yet that's what we were doing. Um, and then as awards are issued um, from a sponsor that we would sub to each other, um, a task order is issued that's specific to that particular award. So you're only looking at scope and budget, just like you would like on a PI, co-PI situation. Maybe there's some terms that are outside that master collaboration agreement that we have to look at. Um, in addition, um, it was decided at leadership level that we would not charge uh, FNA on that first 25K that we charge to our normal sub. So there's a slight advantage um, to working with each other. So maybe a PI has a choice to go to Northwestern, they will instead consider some of the uh, opportunities within uh, working with another PI. Um, 
we have, uh, and then the final thing um, is looking at how do we just do the proposal process differently and what do those reviews look like? What can we, we do uh, on the documentation side from subcontracts and subawards? So all those things have been um, streamlined to a point where um, it's a lot cleaner than it's been before. Is it perfect? No, not yet. I think there's still a lot we're going to learn. Um, the invoicing side is the next thing we're looking at. How do we not invoice each other if that's a possibility? Um, you know, just charge a speed type directly. But there's a lot of challenges with that to ensure that we have financial control and, and this thing. So that's the next thing that's being teed up. Um, at the same time, in parallel, they're looking at the um, seed grant process and programs that are being put in from the research side to kind of force that collaboration between PIs, just getting them to know what's going on, what repositories of, of um, expertise is there. Um, we're already starting to see some of that. Um, it's gonna take some time to, to get, I think, uh, feet under it. Um, and again, tie up all those processes. There's gonna be several more town halls um, to work through this as it's pushed out. We're fortunate to have a, a program lead on both campuses that will help liaise, and that's part of the website. You will see um, who you can go to for further questions or your PIs can go to. Uh, I'm excited about it. To me, it's common sense, but financial futures was an enabling factor to force that. So it's a good thing. Great. Good to hear. It looked like uh, Anna Gonzalez actually had that question. So Anna, thanks for reading the questions that I already had prepared. Um, so actually my portion of this session is over. Um, if you guys out there have questions, you can either A, feel free to pose them in the chat and I'll read them aloud or B, just unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask away and hopefully we're not talking over each other. So I'll give you a minute to uh, come up with your questions. Otherwise, I have more questions so I can fill the silence. All right, Marissa's got one. Is there any roadmap on creating an MOU with Denver campus? That's a great question. Um, is there a roadmap, um, which would mean that we've written it down yet? Um, no, but there is, it's, I, in fact, I have an email I sent out last week. Why aren't we considering um, Denver campus as well, especially if uh, the way the Anschutz OGC, not of, um, of CG, uh, is under the umbrella of University of Colorado Denver. Um, can we expand it to UC Denver? Can we expand it to UCCS? Should we? Those conversations are happening at leadership. Um, I was fortunate to get to present this to Chancellor and all those folks, and they're thinking about it because why aren't we able to um, use this as an opportunity? A lot goes into that, obviously, financially, but um, long answer to a short question, yes. There's sort of a roadmap, and it's being discussed right now. Um, I think we're tackling the issues part, and then that's the next step because it's really hard to differentiate. Um, when we get things from UC Denver and the proposal side um, is, is, well, is that Anschutz? You got to look at that. You got to look at scope. You know, where's the PI residing? It's not as clean as we thought. One of the things we learned, right? So thanks for that question. Great. Thanks, Gary. All right. I'll wait on any other questions out there. While we're waiting on the question, Nikki, I'll go ahead and say a couple things. Sure. Um, for the DRAs. Um, first of all, Thanks for everything you do. You know, when I say we're really busy, everyone is really busy. I know um, and feel everybody's trying to keep up. Um, I'll tell you, I'm so fortunate that I have a team that cares so much about what they do, their work, your support, um, um, and working with you. Uh, and the mission is to see you. Um, everybody's trying to help as much as they can. I appreciate you guys being here because that communication is the key. Um, you know, you guys are an extension of us. Um, and I would say contract, but all of OCG, because you're the ones that are close to the PI and the, the award. So thank you for that. Um, and, and make sure that uh, we are um, communicating as much as we can. Um, when you have questions, one of the things I think, um, always go to InfoEd. One of the things I always kind of hammer home is to make sure that we use InfoEd as that communication tool. Um, it's a workflow, but it's also a communication tool. Our contract officers, and I know grant officers proposal, everybody keeps it updated as best they can. Um, when you go, if you have any questions, go there first, then reach out to teams, but you are on teams as well and email and pick up the phone if you need to. I, I really want to make sure that we're available as much as we can. Um, understand that sometimes um, our organizations that we have to work through export and 
IP and others, they're also in their queue working through it. So an idea behind um, where is it sitting, sometimes it's just because it's in that other approval queue, they're working through things as fast as they can as well. Um, if it's a no kidding priority, um, please let us know. We're gonna do our best to move it forward, juggling all those priorities. Um, we always prioritize funding actions first for obvious reasons, um, but we do our best to support and adjust the, the needs um, as we can. Um, I've got fortunately a bunch of professionals that understand what they need to do and they're gonna take care of you as best they can. So I just wanted to make sure that part was clear. Thanks, Gary. So I have a quick question um, posed on the chat. I have a PI interested in creating a histology. I have no idea if I said that correctly. Histology lab, histology lab. Should I point her to the AB Nexus? Um, Margaret, why don't you reach out to me first? Let's talk about it because I, I don't want to just point you there if that's not where you should go. I guess I need to understand histology is too. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll research that. But yeah, uh, please reach out to me and I'll, I'll find some time to chat because I'd like to understand what it is and point you in the right direction. Great, thanks. Any other questions out there? If not, yeah. we can Maybe. we can end a few minutes. Oh, I hear someone out there. It, it's it's Anna. Sorry, I was trying to figure out if I could raise my hand or how I want to type this question in. But so for the AB Nexus, Ann shoots this new thing because we have a PI who's ready. My question is: like, is it, was it still the same setup process? Are we still required to have the same form, sub commitment form? Or is there somebody I can reach out to and ask these questions now that we kind of have this change happening? Yeah, and, and so um, we've gone through several several proposals and a couple of awards. So at the proposal stage, um, I guess, Anna, first of all, I think I'm going to point you towards Catherine Snyder from a proposal side that's very specific to proposals, um, I, you know, specific to separate contracts that be Megan. But let's start with Kristen. Um, you'll see her, her name on the AB Nexus website as that entering point. She's kind of the traffic cop for a lot of things. So she may be able to not only answer these questions and would point you to the right place, but also any uh, additional questions that your PI may have from that collaboration standpoint. Um, I'm using Kristen um, Krzyzewski, is, I can't say her last name very well, but she's been great um, at helping to, to, like I said, be a traffic cop. And then she has her counterpart at Anschutz that really um, energizes that collaboration in a way that we couldn't do just on our own. So start there, Anna, and then as always, you know, you can reach out to me too. No, nope, perfect. I will let our PI know because I knew there was a change. I just didn't know exactly what was needed. So I'll start with Kristen and then if we have anything else, I'll let you guys know. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Great. So we're reaching the end of our time. Gary, so appreciate you coming to do this kind of on a short notice. Um, and appreciate you answering all the AP Nexus questions because I know that's a pretty complex deal. And oh, thank, thank you. you guys for coming. So DRAs and OCG folks, appreciate having you guys. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks for everybody coming. And again, I appreciate it. And um, thanks for all you do. Great. And again, this will be on the website. So I will post it and send a follow up. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. I'll see you later.